I'm not feeling it. Let's try that one more time with a little more gusto. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, fantastic. You are my coffee and my passion. <laughs> So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Sight of Green Phoenix, your secular oasis here in the valley. I am your host and president, Chris, and Alex, the vice president, is off the back taking care of business. Uh, today's events are brought to you by the generosity of our donors and you, people who donate and feed the jar. You keep us open, you keep us alive. Thank you for believing in our mission, and can't do it without you. Thanks so much. How was breakfast? Great. I noticed all my cookies are gone. <laughs> Anita was hoping to steal two for George. Well, I got one. She got one, okay. For me. <laughs> That's what's important. <laughs> all right, so thank you, breakfast crew. Thanks for getting here real early and setting up all the tables, setting up uh, breakfast and all the meats and meats. Uh, can't do it without you. You're awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's a lot of work. I watched them do it. <laughs> I was doing other stuff. Um, so we are a membership uh, funded organization, so if you'd like to become a member, we'd love to have you. You can just speak to Elizabeth on your way out toward lunch, or just you know come talk and I'll convince you that we're awesome and you want to be with us because we're also awesome. So, yeah. um, so if you have a cell phone, please silence it. It needs to be silenced. Anybody here for the first time? Awesome, thanks so much. Yeah, welcome. Good to see our advertisements on Facebook, which are non-existent or working. <laughs> it's good to have you here, thanks so much for coming by. Um, do we have any pins? First time pins, anybody? Maybe next time. So we are going to lunch, so since you're all new here, uh, we'd love to have you at lunch. I know I already talked to you about going to lunch. It's going to be a lot of fun. Our speaker will be joining us, and uh, Richard will be hosting over at the Mesa Family Restaurant. You don't know where that is? Mesa Community Restaurant. Mesa Community Restaurant. Yes. You used to have a family in that name. Yeah, yeah. If you look it up on your phone, it's Mesa Community Restaurant. I'm easily confused. They can't do that to me. So we'd love to have you at lunch. If you need directions or whatever, just come up see me, or you can see Richard, and we'll point you in the right direction. It's pretty easy. It's right around the corner. Um, Anybody else want to do historian? We, we're looking for a historian, somebody to document everything that's going on here, and we could really use some help with that. Uh, anybody like to do? Uh, Roxanne. You still, Roxanne? Would you like to do historian stuff? Oh, oh. I think so. <laughs> she already said she would. I have, I have it confirmed in blood. Confirmed in blood. That's a contract right there. All right, we'll talk. Um, we're also looking for a yard care person. Uh, Bill Oliphant uh, was forced to move back to Utah uh, to be with his very Mormon family. <laughs> so we could really use somebody to help us out with the yard. Uh, so our, our play yard out here is for the kids. We like to keep it green so they have something to play with outside when it's not a billion degrees out. And that's coming up real quick, so we could use some help with that. Any, any volunteers help us with the yard work? We have we have a water. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Let's join me in thanking your name. Tio, Tio, It's amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, also, uh, we have some open board positions this year. If you've been a member for at least a year and you'd like to say in how we run things and contribute to doing that with your own hands. We could use some help. So, uh, right now we have the uh, program director position, which is open, and uh, we have an opportunity on the property director position as well. So if you'd like to sign up for either of those, we'd love to have you, and we can tell you about the, the nominations process after. So think about it, we could use some help, plus you get a hand in running the joint and some of the blame too. So it's all good. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a very rewarding experience. It's amazing coming here and seeing everybody's faces. And this is the product of everything we've been doing. Um, this is the mission. And this is where we, where we want to go. And we need your help to do it. So please do consider that. Uh, and I'll we'll see you next year on the board. Uh, we're also having a Flying Spaghetti Monster planning session, Flying Spaghetti Monster dinner planning session right after this meeting. So just stick around. And uh, we'll keep it a little short. Uh, it's just kind of a check-in, and then we can head out to lunch. So, good. 
see you there. Um, future meetings. So we've got Smart Recovery, as always, every Monday night, 7 p.m. If you're struggling or you know somebody who's struggling with an addiction, could be eating disorders, could be illicit substances, could be alcohol, could be video games. <laughs> you laugh, sure. but it's a thing. <laughs> I think they just classified a, a video game addiction as a, as a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, come on by, we'd love to have you. It's a very open atmosphere. It's a, it's a peer-to-peer support group. Uh, yeah, so head on by. Um, Humanities Project. So we're having, we had it last scheduled for last time, but it didn't end up happening because of an event. But we have the sound scientific study of sensual cognition of mood musics, uh, music moods rather, uh, by our distinguished professors, Zenaido Quintana and Jennifer White of the Quintana White Institute of Sound Science. I think they have their same accreditation from uh, Trump University, so <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> But uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, they're going to do some scientific studies about how you feel about music and how it impacts your emotional state. So if you're uh, not busy, next Friday, September 14th, come on by right here at 7 o'clock, I think. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So show, come on by. Trump nicked the Johnson Amendment, so go ahead and rip, man. Go Hasn't ahead. happened yet, but we'll see. OK, so we have a big, huge, 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 big thing, massive, huge thing. Uh, <laughs> wow. I don't know how, how else like to say that. It's gi ginormous, gigantic, go. Googleistic. Huge. Yes. Ginormous. The Saperstein Gala is next Saturday night. And if you don't know who they are, you should. Um, Hal and Doreen have really, really love this community. And they have made this building possible. We were pretty sure the only humanist community in the country with their own building. Right? This, is, this is unique. This is not normal, but you know that because you know we're all special people. Uh, we, have, we have found our way out of various places. Um, and, and Hal and Doreen have made this place special for all of us. And we're going to have a huge bash, huge bash, Saturday night for them. And it's in honor of them and their contributions to not just this community, but a lot of other communities and organizations that they've supported over the years as well. They are fantastic people, and we would love to have you join us, celebrate their contribution and life's work for our first annual Extraordinary, Extraordinary Humanist, Humanist Award. Award. We have seats available for sale if you can, but we're also opening up registration so that we have people who have paid for seats uh, on behalf of other people. So if you need a, uh, one of our sponsored seats, please sign up and we will get you in touch with the right people. And we'd love to have you there uh, just as a way of showing appreciation for our dear friends and patrons, Hal and Dory. So please do sign up, go to hsgp.org and there's an event for the for inside the uh, inside the events listing for the Hal and Doreen uh, Saperstein Gala event, and sign up for that. And that's it. That's all you need to do. And it's not here. It's at the Scottsdale Plaza Resort. That's right. <laughs> we ran out of space here. That's how many people are showing up. So this is going to be a big event. It's going to be huge. Please do go and sign up right now, or you know, right after during lunch or something. Chris, told us to turn on our phones. We can't. I do not know about assigned um, tables. So they're, they're, um, they're, you're gonna, some tables are reserved and assigned, but most of it, you're going to be able to sit where you want when you can get there. Thank you. Go ahead, Zanido. You've got one slide. Chris, you might have some <laughs> special guests of some national organizations that are making trips across the country to attend the event. So. Very good. I did forget about that. Thanks so much. Zanayo is saying that uh, we have a lot of big names and big organizations coming to this event to honor Hal and Doreen. Uh, representatives from the Secular Coalition for America, representatives from the American Humanist Association, ACLU, ACLU FFRF, I think? No, Facebook. No? All right. The local group. The local, the local, local FFRF. FFRF. Yeah. There's tons of other big names that are coming. Uh, it's going to be a huge batch. We're going to have a lot of fun. Meet some of your heroes. Say hello and honor your current local heroes. That's the end of my huge event. Um, 
right after, we're going to be, well not right after, the, the day after, if you can stand, uh, we'll be doing Philosophy to the Influence, and uh, this meeting is going to be on Moral Luck, and that's going to be on September 16th, right here, 5 o'clock. Moral Luck. Moral Luck. Good luck. That. <laughs> the, the Philosophy Night's always fun. Come on by. Because it's under Have a drink. <laughs> So Tori came to us about a month ago and did a legislative update. We're having a second go at this on the west side. So if you've driven here from the west side, you'd like to go see her event because you missed it. You can go uh, see that. Uh, we have it on the website. Tori Roberg is going to be doing the legislative roundup for this last session. So if you missed it, you want to see it, head on out to the west side. It's going to be September 20th at 6.30 to 8 p.m. Still looking for a place. So hold on. Um, book club. This one threw me for a loop. The, the book title is The Trouble with Goats and Sheep. <laughs> I have to say, the Amazon reviews are nothing to do with that. So, I know Roy's in the back there. I, 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 it said, it, I'll just read one, one short one. An astute, engaging debut, The Trouble with Goats and Sheep is a quirky and utterly charming tale, a community in need of reconciliation, and two girls learning what it means to belong. So this is gonna be this September 22nd at 10 a.m. It's Saturday right here. So. You have time to read the book, go ahead and grab it and figure out. You can tell me why Goats and Sheep are in the title when it doesn't seem to have anything to do with Goats and Sheep. Read Clever the marketing. You don't have to read the book. It's not what you think. Democrats are your own. It's not what I think. <laughs> <laughs> the George Clinton movie. And, and finally, uh, Sunday Speaker, our next one. Uh, what Can You Believe If You Don't Believe in God by Michael Werner. Learn the answers to some of life's crucial questions. What is true? How shall we live our lives? How do I find my purpose, meaning, and joy in life? We have a guest coming in, Michael Werner, the author of the newly, highly acclaimed book, What Can You Believe If You Don't Believe in God? So it's a good author to come and support. It's gonna be a cool event. Come on by, that's gonna be at our next Sunday speaker meeting, September 23rd at 10 a.m. Breakfast is at nine, and if I get some good reviews, maybe I'll bake cookies again. It's up to you folks. I gotta get that praise. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so uh, Pam, would you like to come up and introduce our speaker? Yes. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today. Her, her name is Annie Domgard, Professor Domgard. Um, Annie was born and raised in a small village in Denmark. After college and training in medical technology in Copenhagen, she immigrated to the U.S. She worked in a small freestanding emergency room for 20 years, soon recognizing how the body and mind collaborated in creating illness in patients. To better understand this body-mind connection, she studied psychology for five years in graduate school. Annie also became involved with holistic healthcare and helped set up a holistic healthcare program at the ER where she worked. During that time, she also began to study public health and published an article focusing on the benefits of merging public health initiatives with holistic health care. In the emergency room, Annie treated patients with diverse socioeconomic standing and race, and race ethnic backgrounds. As a result, she recognized that both mind and culture are po powerful determinants of health and illness. Consequently, she pursued graduate work once again, earning a PhD in sociology. In the late 1990s, Annie began her second career teaching sociology at ASU, and an accumulation of her own and students' diverse perspectives, which led to the writing of her book, Schizophrenic America, and which she's going to share some of the thoughts from that today. So please help me welcome a wonderful person and wonderful friend, Ms. Annie Dongard. Thanks for coming up and to listening to me. Um, I was uh, motivated to write this book because I kept hearing the same type of stories from my students at the university where I was teaching. And uh, uh, the students were typically in uh, uh, an upper division sociology class. And I believe that the uh, stories began 
uh, somewhat after our Great Recession, maybe around 2010. And they typically went like this, the story. When I was a little kid, I used to think the United States was the greatest country in the world. Land of the free, home of the brave. We have liberal democracy, uh, equality of opportunity, and if everybody just works hard enough, we will all get a piece of the pie. And then they continued. But now today, when I'm ready to uh, graduate from uh, college, I have a completely different understanding of the United States. I no longer think we have uh, equality, liberty, democracy, and so forth. And even if I work two or three jobs simultaneously, I might never achieve the American dream. And when they were finished talking, uh, they uh, seemed frustrated, uh, hopeless, even depressed. And then I began to uh, feel depressed because I remember that when I uh, graduated from college, um, there were plenty of uh, uh, well-paying jobs available to me. So I wanted to find out what psychosocial factors initially made my students feel so uh, positive about their country? And I did some research, and uh, uh, thank you, <laughs> and uh, 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 found some, uh, 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 some factors. I call these factors uh, our cultural eye or our inalienable rights. And they are then uh, liberty, democracy, equality of opportunity, laissez-faire, uh, market theory, and citizenry. And the citizenry, I mean that citizens in the United States, they have the right to participate in local and state government uh, on a regular basis, not just once every four <coughs> years when there is a, a presidential election. And of course, these ideals are wonderful uh, factors on which uh, to uh, uh, found a great country. But then I wanted to find out what factors then later on made my students feel so uh, disillusioned with the United States. And again, I did some research and I came up with another uh, few factors and uh, uh, I call these factors our cultural need or simply the American way of life. Uh, social Darwinism is one of them. And with social Darwinism, I mean that for the last five, six uh, decades, political policies have favored people with money and with merit, and then kind of dismissed the rest of the population. And now we have this 1% versus the 99% inequality in our country. Plutocracy is another one, or ruled by the plutocrats, the rich people. Economic elitism, or crony capitalism, another one. Uh, conformity and consumerism, I believe, go hand in hand. Since Second World War, Americans have been socialized to become consumers. They were told the more they buy, the more they consume, the more stuff they have, the happier they will be. So Americans have been on this hedonic treadmill for many decades in order to pursue happiness. But really, they have worked hard and tried to consume a lot of stuff. But this was just a ploy by the plutocrats to pacify the American population so they themselves, the plutocrats, could pursue their happiness, creating this 1% versus the 99% inequality in society. So when I put these two uh, slides next to each other, you can see that there's a stark contrast between what we believe and how we behave. A stark contrast indeed. 
And that was a surprise to me, and it was a surprise to my students, too. But then I wanted to find another example of this stark contrast between what we believe and how we behave. So here's another one. And I call this slide our sacred realm of life versus our secular realm of life. And under our sacred realm of life, I have found factors that represent our Christian heritage in this country, but they are also important tenets in other world religions. So, thou shalt not kill, anti-militarism, anti-materialism, community, and cooperation. But look, under our secular realm of life, or simply the American way of life, we have just the opposite factors. We have the death penalty, we are very militaristic, very materialistic. We believe in individualism and we believe, believe in competition. So, after I had reflected on these two slides for a while, it dawned on me that uh, the culture in the United States actually has a split personality. <laughs> And a split personality is the layman's term for schizophrenia. And then I make the bold assertion that people in the United States suffer from a culturally induced schizophrenia. And I begin to wonder what effect does it have on people when they must navigate through many contradictory uh, beliefs and behavior day in and day out, year after year. And in order to figure out what the effects are, I go to the APA, American, oops, so I guess I need to go there, uh, the American Psychiatric Association, in order to find out what the symptoms are of schizophrenia uh, in individuals. Disorganized thinking is one of them. Grandiose delusions is another one. Uh, rigid beliefs or dogmatic belief systems, another one. And skipping from topic to topic. But then I begin to think, hmm, I see similar type of behavior in uh, the American uh, people at large. And I call these similar types of behavior than symptoms of culturally induced schizophrenia. So you can imagine our problem with focusing or, or critically thinking, uh, it, it could be, or connecting the dots, whatever you want to say, could uh, correspond to disorganized thinking in the APA terms. Ethnocentrism and egocentrism could correspond to this uh, grandiose delusions that uh, APA talk about. And uh, ethnocentrism has always been uh, a big problem in our country concerning this race ethnic uh, conflict that we have. Egocentrism, on the other hand, I believe go hand in hand with this uh, uh, social Darwinism I talked about before, that people with merit and money, they simply feel entitled to get a piece of the pie. And then they kind of uh, just dismiss the rest of the population. And that is, of course, a very narcissistic way of thinking. Finally, our inability to focus, which is such a big problem in school children today, it could then uh, correspond to uh, uh, skipping from topic to topic. So, the first part of my book, it uh, 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 examines uh, the uh, origin of this schizophrenia that I believe we have in society and how it has been maintained over the years. The next slide is pretty uh, self-explanatory. <laughs> and then I'm going to take a drink here. 
Now, in order to make sense of my data, I must put them into some type of sociological framework. And here I use George Herbert Mead's theory. Mead was a social psychologist, and he examined the relationship between individuals and society. How individuals initially create society, and then once society has been created, established, then that society turns around and molds human beings in that society. And it is, of course, a feedback loop, and it changes from time to time. But let me explain to you how it works. So according to me, everybody in society has a core inner self, and he calls that an I, a core inner self. It is universal. It doesn't matter where you were born, uh, what time in human history you were born. It is, uh, it's the same, okay? It is your life energy, so to speak. It is where your creativity and your spontaneity uh, are uh, contained. But we also have a me or an external self, or the image that we show to the rest of the world. And this me, that <coughs> external self, has been molded to time and space molded initially by uh, our parents, our mentors, religious ideology, and later on by uh, uh, peer groups, uh, workplace, political ideology, and for the sake of this talk, schizophrenic America, our uh, cultural I and our cultural me. Now, here's something very important in his theory. There's always a dialogue going on. And uh, I'm going to see if I can figure out where that is. There, a dialogue between our uh, I, our core inner self, and our me, our external self. There's always a dialogue going on there in our minds. Okay, And let me explain to you how that works. So you wake up one morning, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and you say to yourself, hmm, today I'm going to take a mental health day. I'm going to uh, bring my guitar out, I'm going to jam on it for a couple of hours, and then I'm going to write a song. Or maybe I'll just go hiking in the woods. Just be, just be one with nature and you feel so good, you feel so creative, so spontaneous, you have all these energy, right? But then, once that me, that one there, okay, that, that molded me finds out what goes on inside yourself. <laughs> it says, no, stop, you can't do that. You can't take the day off. You need to go to work. You have a, a project you're working on. A deadline is coming up soon. What would your uh, boss say if you don't show up for work? What would your co-worker say if uh, you don't help them uh, with this project and uh, the deadline that is coming up and so forth? No, you can't do that. You have to go to work. But you might get fired if you don't show up, right? And you have a mortgage to pay off and you have bills coming in every month. So notice how all of a sudden, all that excitement, all that uh, energy that you had just a moment ago, it just vanishes from your body. And you get up and you then uh, uh, go to work, right? Now, let's take a closer look at this me, that external self, that uh, uh, image that you show to the rest of the world. Let's take a closer look at that. Now that you've found out that you have to go to work, you can't really take that mental health day. Let's 
a lot of social anxiety that you show to the rest of the world because that's the way you feel inside. And I believe that that social anxiety then is a symptom of this culturally induced schizophrenia. Okay. So you go to work, you work all day long, and then you drive home, you drive into your garage, and you close your garage door after you, and then you isolate yourself in your house. Okay. And after you are isolating yourself in your house for a year, five years, maybe 10 years, you begin to feel a little, maybe racist, mm -hmm. a little sexist, even xenophobic. You don't really want to hang out with anybody that doesn't look like you, that doesn't think like you, that doesn't behave like you do. And alone in your house, you doll yourself with passive entertainment. And you yourself begin to become passive, okay? In spite of the fact that you live in a very aggressive and very competitive uh, society. And see, I believe that our whole society has taken on this passive aggressive type of behavior. Everything is just fine and peaceful for a while, and then whoops, all of a sudden, a school shooting over there, and other shooting over there, and some public event. Or maybe we'll just start another war. So let's take a closer look at the our core inner self, that individual uh, I that we was talking about. How is that faring in this schizophrenic America? Well, we have a decreased life energy, we have decreased spontaneity, decreased uh, creativity, uh, we might feel kind of unmotivated, hopeless, maybe even stressed depressed or suicidal. And see, it was exactly these symptoms that I used to see my students when they told the stories about United States. So, I then decided <laughs> to uh, create a, ha I didn't create it myself, but a happiness chart, a flow chart. And you can take a look at it for a minute and see where you are within this flow chart. <laughs> now, if you're someone who uh, would like to change something, which is right there, I invite you to follow along in the rest of my discussion because the second part of my book is about changing something. It is about achieving holistic well-being. Now, the definition of holistic health is to create a balance between one's body, one's spirit, and one's mind. So the spirit can then be uh, related to uh, this core inner self, our I. Okay, that contains our life energy. And the mind could be analogous to uh, this dialogue that always goes on in our mind between our I and our me. Okay, a dialogue that's always going on. So, if you're ready, let's walk down the path of holistic well-being. So I believe that there are at least three, and I'm mentioning three important steps to take here. The first one being empowering and awakening. I guess first you have to awaken and then empower that core inner self. Okay, And that can be done uh, through meditation, uh, through journaling, where you examine this I need dialogue, okay? Or you can go to counseling, or you can become introspective, whatever works for you. The important thing is that you get started awakening and empowering this core inner self. Because after a while you realize that you no longer 
have to be a slave to peer pressure or to uh, uh, your environment. You have agency and you can become captain of your own ship, so to speak. And see, once you're captain of your own ship, then you can begin to resist business as usual. One individual at a time, it will create a ripple effect all over the world. And that's very empowering. A few uh, options here that you can take or choices. Uh, buy for need, not for greed. It was Gandhi who once said, the world has enough resources for need, but not for greed. Spread kindness, not wrath. Build bridges, not walls. And see, when you're ready to build bridges, you can take the third step down the path to holistic well-being. You join support groups. Okay? You begin to talk to people about the norms and the values of society. You might uh, establish some learning centers and talk to people about the benefits of achieving holistic well-being. Okay? Maybe you will build grassroots voices and completely start to reorganize society. And you know what? That is happening right now as we speak. Through what we call uh, protest democracy. Consider the Me Too movement, Walk for Our Life, uh, Red for Ed. And if you don't want to go out in the street and bang pots and pans, <laughs> see, then you can uh, get involved with this protest democracy in another way. You can subscribe uh, to several organizations that will send to you through social media petitions that you can sign if you believe in these petitions and send them back and uh, then that way become involved with this uh, uh, social transmission. Um, uh, PERC, Public Interest Research Group, um, they, uh, uh, they look into uh, big corporations, they investigate them to see if these corporations are uh, engaging in unethical uh, behavior. And if they are, if they are, they try to keep them accountable, try to have them change their behavior. And they send out petitions to the people that subscribe to PERC. Okay, and tell them about these unethical behavior that uh, uh, these certain organizations are involved in. And if they have lots of, hundreds, thousands of petitions that are signed by people that subscribe to PERC, see then uh, PERC has a, a, a much better chance to get these organizations to uh, change their unethical behavior. Change.org and Peer Plus US uh, um, <clears throat> have online petition tools. So people like you and I, we can go into these organizations <laughs> and create our own petitions. And these petitions will then be sent out to thousands of people nationwide and sometimes even uh, uh, to many other countries in the world, okay? And uh, uh, that way, little by little, one individual at a time that is sitting home and, and uh, uh, signing these petitions can create a tremendous uh, change in the world. I just recently read that uh, a couple of kids uh, that uh, were uh, writing their own petition, they were only 10 years old, writing their own petition uh, to uh, change.org there. Uh, they uh, uh, changed the way many restaurants uh, uh, treat people, so to speak. Uh, they, these little kids, they no longer wanted all these straws that are, are given uh, to kids uh, 
they, they didn't want that anymore. They thought it was uh, uh, not good for the earth to have all these straws, uh, uh, you know, lying around all over the place. So imagine little ten-year-old kids. How empowering it must be that they have changed uh, the behavior of some of these uh, big uh, restaurants in our country. Mm -hmm. I think this is amazing. Now, these. Uh, 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 these steps that I have talked about so far, uh, the steps to holistic well-being, uh, these examples here are what we call uh, bottom-up approaches to uh, uh, social transformation. They're called bottom-up because it is the people at the bottom that uh, uh, try to make these changes that hopefully will leave the top uh, lawmakers uh, sitting somewhere uh, you know, on the hill or whatever. But that's not enough. We also need uh, top-down approaches to social transformation in order for these transformations to stick in society. And in order to figure out how we do that, I seek help from another sociologist, Max Weber. Max Weber studied societies from the top down, okay? It is as if we took a panorama picture of societies. And he said that there are three psychosocial factors, three psychosocial factors in any given society throughout time and space that hold society together and they create a synergy in society that is nearly impossible uh, to break. These three factors, they reinforce each other clockwise and counterclockwise. That's why you see these uh, doubled arrows there between the uh, factors. And they are cultural ideology, they are psychological orientation of actors, or the way people make sense out of their cultural ideology. And then patterns of social action or how we act out uh, our cultural ideology. So let's take a look at what these factors are in schizophrenic America. <laughs> Our cultural ideology is, I hope so, individualism and the American dream. So how do people make sense out of individualism and the American dream? Well, typically it goes like this. Each and every person is responsible for his or her own successes and failures. And if they don't achieve the American dream, it's their own fault, okay? They are often uh, seen as failures in society and disrespected by the rest of the population that uh, uh, achieved the American dream. Now, so what does the psychological orientation of actors look like? So we all, we all have so much anxiety because we are so afraid of failing. We are so afraid that we are not going to keep up with our peers, right? Okay. So how do we act out our cultural ideologies uh, considering that we have a lot of social anxiety? Okay. Well, we begin to compete with our uh, uh, friends, with our co-workers, and so forth. And if competition isn't enough, we begin to compete aggressively. And see, these three factors, they have been in place in the United States since the inception of our country. They have reinforced each other clockwise and counterclockwise. And they have created a synergy in society that I'm sure you all have felt. And that synergy is nearly impossible uh, to break. But you know what? It is breaking right now as we speak. It's breaking. <coughs> Why? Well, first, because of this 
uh, bottom-up approaches to social change that we just talked about. Secondly, because the newer generations, the millennials and the Gen Zs, they don't, they don't buy into the system any longer. They see a new vision. They see a new cultural <coughs> ideology called cultures of caretaking. And what does that mean? That means that nations are strong when they protect the weak, that nations are rich when they care for the poor. And see, when enough people are on board with that idea, then we can use Weber's template to create world peace. And what does that look like? How is the cultural ideology going to look? Well, we are going to have two. We are going to have holistic well-being, and we know now exactly how to achieve that, because I told you about it, right? And then we are going to have these cultures of caretaking. What are we going to put in psychological orientation of actors? How are we going to make sense of these two uh, cultural ideologies. Well, we are going to realize that we are all in it together. We are one big, diverse family. And how are we going to act it out? Okay. Well, we are going to act it out by taking care of ourselves, this holistic well-being, okay? taking care of others, protecting the weak and caring for the poor. Okay? We are going to realize that we want to treat our neighbors the way we want our neighbors to treat us. And see, these three factors, they are going to hold society together, this new society, okay? once we go through this paradigm shift. Okay? They are going to reinforce each other clockwise and counterclockwise. And they are going to create a synergy in society that again would be nearly impossible to break. So that's all I have. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> We had some time for some comments and questions. So raise your hand and let me come and see what the microphone is. Uh, let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Uh, how do we deal with the free rider problem? I hear that all the time from my students. I'm sure you do. Yeah. So you know what? Uh, from my point of view, it's not a problem. There's so few people really that are free riders. I worry a lot more about the people at the top. Yeah. Okay. So can you explain the free rider problem? For those of us who don't know that. Uh, do you want to explain uh, what you mean by free rider? What free riders are? A uh, free rider is somebody who benefits but doesn't bear any of the cost. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. So, uh, 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 yeah, as I said, I worry a lot more about uh, the people at the top. But free riders can be at the top, too. Yeah, they can be at the top. So we need to change their behavior. We need to put pressure on them to change their behavior. It might take a long time. It might take 20 years. But you know what? It's <laughs> worth working at. Yeah. You want me to continue for a moment? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, I mean, I think I'm, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying, but isn't there an element of coercion to make sure that everyone in, in the process contributes to the well-being of the society? Uh, maybe, maybe not. You know what? Uh, if you treat another person kindly, gently, with compassion, at first they might fight it off, and they typically do, okay? But after a while, they're going to break. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and if they don't, well, so what? You know, the rest of us uh, can still work on this uh, uh, 
world, world peace. But uh, yeah, there are some that won't. I agree. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you would agree that what you have up there was initially supposed to be the structure of Christianity until it got really messed up. Um, uh, maybe. I, I am not uh, uh, familiar with a, a lot of uh, uh, these ideas about Christianity. But uh, uh, where I come from, if I may talk about that, uh, uh, we, but we never ever talk about po uh, God in politics. I mean, that's completely separated. And we are very, very secular. But our uh, socialistic uh, uh, laws, our uh, political, so sociological laws, and so forth, they are based on sweep your neighbor like yeah. yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, a good point there. Back here. Hey, Annie, in, in answer to freeloading, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in naming and shaming. If you can get their name out with uh, bad publicity and keep it out there, maybe you'll shame them. Okay. Help me with that then. <laughs> Annie, so how would you address the normal mindset of an individual who is still stuck in the old cultural ideology and how would you get them from where they are today to this mindset this framework yeah you can help me with that buddha <laughs> right uh, uh, you know what first of all i think that uh, there need to be a lot of good role models out there Okay? And uh, uh, that can uh, uh, kind of help people along. Good role models that uh, uh, the unfortunate people can uh, uh, look up to and say, I want to be like that person. And uh, so role modeling is one way. But uh, as I talked before about uh, uh, learning centers where uh, people can uh, get together and learn about uh, the values of uh, creating a, a holistic uh, well-being. And uh, with that, you know, a lot of, uh, as you said yourself, uh, resisting business as usual, uh, introspection and so forth. But we need good role models yeah. in society. Over here. The, uh, <clears throat> I think four times the question has come up of uh, free freeloaders, free riders, or even the uh, and behind that there's this idea of uh, how how are we going to pay for it, and that, which the re question of Republicans often ask as well. There's this um, Calvinistic puritanical strain that's in our country, and you 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 touched on it earlier with the first the individual, the rugged individualism. So even now, I could see it in this room that it's hard to overcome because there's the idea of community and compassion and empathy sort of takes a back seat to the uh, puritanical strain that uh, pretty much permeates our society. Yes, I, I suppose. I don't really know how to answer that question because uh, what are we paying for now? Who's paying for... Uh, what we have right now. And the changes that I'm talking about, uh, is that going to cost anything? Is that going to cost the individual any money at all? I don't see, uh, see that. I have made those changes myself. It didn't cost me anything. So uh, is that, the, uh, uh, is that the, the type of answer that you're looking for, or uh, am I explaining this correctly? Or? Exactly. Well, there's, there's the idea that we gave uh, $16 trillion to the banks under TARP, and yet no one asked how we were going to pay for that. But when it comes to making a better society or helping our fellow human beings, that you know, every penny has to be accounted for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yes, it is a, it's, I, it's a perfectly acceptable answer. Yeah. Okay, right here, Roy. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> there's a number of problems uh, 
that uh, I think could help address these things. Uh, one, you know, th this idea of treating your neighbor like you want to be treated uh, works fine unless you live next to a family of masochists. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, this, this happens. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, changing a society to, uh, to have better, or try and eliminate these uh, uh, problems of preloading, for instance, uh, as one example. Uh, if we would teach children in, while they're still in school uh, good parenting skills, and I think this will go a long way to help prevent a lot of these problems. Another thing is uh, uh, people that uh, don't have health care can be from very desperate feeling and uh, because of that uh, desperate people sometimes do desperate things. If we had health care for everyone that would be another step going toward uh, helping a lot of these situations I think. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. So uh, what I often talk to my, my students about uh, at the university uh, when they ask about uh, uh, Denmark, where I came from, and why we are the way we are, I always say, you know what, it is so easy over there to go out in the streets and bang pots and pans and, uh, uh, st and stand up uh, against uh, you know, the upper echelon because, uh, you know, if we take some time out and go out there and uh, strike, we are not going to lose our job. We are not going to lose our health care. We have a safety net, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, it, it, it can be a lot easier to try to change society in a, pay, in a place where uh, there is a good safety net. And people don't have that here in the United States. And that's why they are desperate. And they are so desperate that they don't know how to change anything. They are so stuck. In, uh, uh, in this uh, box that they uh, have grown up in and they are in because they are uh, worried about, you know, how am I going to pay for the next uh, rent or uh, food and so forth. But you also write about the children. And in my book, I do say that we need, some people need to stand up for these children in the United States. Okay. We need a, a new social movement. We have had the feminist movement, the civil rights movements, and many other movements. We need to have a children's movement. Oh, very good. Because uh, children in the United States compared <laughs> to children in many, many other places in the world, okay? uh, uh, they are suffering here. They are suffering. And that is, uh, 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 it is, it, it is very, very sad. It is very sad because we are supposed to be the richest country in the world. And the way we are taking care of our children here, our families here, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, somebody talked about blaming. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, even though I hate to blame uh, anybody, but this is something that we need to look at. And children need to learn from the start about uh, diversity, that we are all in it together, and that we have to uh, treat each other with respect and compassion and so forth. It starts right from the, uh, your little child. Okay, um, I would like to ask you if you can back up your slide show to, I think it's about the third slide where you had spiritual <coughs> on the left and secular on the right. And I want to ask sacred. Sacred, sacred. Oh, yeah. And, and secular. Okay. Can you go back to that slide, please? I think it was like number three. There. Okay. And you said that that had to do with our Christian heritage. I am very disturbed by this slide. Um, I think that everything on the left is a secular humanist value. If you'll read down the list, you will see that secular humanists are compassionate, we have community. This has nothing to do with the sacred in our interpretation and in our philosophy here at the Humanist Society. Everything on the right column under secular is what we get a bad rap for. This is what they, when they 
use it in the, in the pejorative, and they're saying, you know, you secular people, and this is what you value. You value conser- consumerism, and you, you know, you're, you're individualists, and you're, and you're militarists. I, I believe that those are mislabeled, and I'd like your opinion on that. Okay. Uh, I uh, uh, kind of. Uh, I don't really know what to say because uh, I think that the uh, humanist, uh, uh, but maybe they they do uh, try to behave in ways that, uh, according to uh, our heritage, which uh, what I said back then uh, is a, a Christian heritage. Uh, so Christianity, uh, Christianity, or any religion has. Uh, a, a very a sacred part to it, but also a very uh, secular part to it. It's a culture, and it is uh, uh, something that you do in the church. It is uh, uh, worshiping uh, and so forth. And the uh, secular part of Christianity uh, is just a culture. You may not at all be a Christian or Muslim or Jew or whatever, but the culture is still there, and it is very, very strong in us, okay? Uh, so just because uh, you are not a uh, Jew or uh, Catholic or whatever, you still have that culture in you, even though it is a secular, uh, uh, you are very, very secular person, but that culture doesn't go away just because uh, you are an atheist. You see, we grow up in this culture, and all religions or all uh, all societies are based on uh, some form of religion because when these uh, societies first uh, uh, developed, we didn't have uh, judges, we didn't have police, we didn't have uh, jails and so forth. Uh, so there was a way to keep uh, everybody uh, uh, you know, be nice or whatever. And, uh, and so we develop uh, some form of religiosity in order to Slash make sure patriarchy. that, that the people, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, well, that's a, a, another part of it, in, in order to make sure that people uh, behave themselves. So even though we say we are atheists, we still have these behaviors, they are embedded in our society. But we can deconstruct them and change them and therefore change that culture, therefore we would be be denying that culture, we would say, I reject that culture which is linked to that religion and I'm gonna create a new form of culture which is an old form of culture which is a caretaking culture, it's not new. And the dichotomy to me is like, we're, we're, I think we're facing a referendum on, are we going to be Sparta America or are we going to be Athens America? And that's our referendum. That's what we face today. It's what we faced when Philip K. Dick was writing his books like, hey, we're in Nero time again. Hey, welcome to it. Are we Athens or Sparta? Athens or Sparta? Okay, let's go back. See, I can't talk like that, but... Uh, uh, okay. oh. Thank you. I'm going to go to the microphone. No, I'm, I'm out of here. Thank you very much. It was very, very beautiful. Okay. Um, I, I want to say one thing, and then I, I, I want to ask you something. I don't think you have to be an atheist to be a humanist. No. Okay. So no. When you I totally agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm not an atheist. No. Okay. Neither am I. Okay. But, okay. yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I know you're coming from a sociological point of view, but I wanted to ask you a question on the economic viewpoint. So are you talking about moving from capitalism to socialism? Is that what what I see here, or am I? Uh, you know what? Sustainability. Uh, More a sustainability? I think sustainability is probably socialism. That's a good one. What we have in, the, in Europe is welfare capitalism. We don't have, uh, where I come from in uh, mm-hmm. uh, Western Europe and uh, Eastern Europe now and all over the place, we don't have socialism. We have what's called welfare capitalism. Right. People own their own uh, stores, own yeah. business and so forth, but we have this safety net. Right, but what I, what I want to bring up is many people that are entrenched in the American dream beliefs are very fearful when they see or hear anything that is 
the word socialism. Yeah. So then, then we would have to talk about what are you calling it again? Yeah. Welfare capitalism. Welfare capitalism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're so right. We need to talk word. about that. Mm -hmm. When people are afraid, very you know, then they are in this <laughs> box. Okay, they're not going to change. Right. So we need to. We're uh, going to become uh, Venezuela. Yeah, yeah, which care. is just a. Uh, okay. Hold on a second. This refers back to a subject we were on a while ago, but people were asking, how do you show a change in culture? And I think the first thing you show is yourself. When you go to offer a service, be it something you think would be nice or something that is absolutely necessary to allow someone to continue to exist in this society, you are presenting that change. You are representing it. So trying to convince people not to be afraid is kind of like letting them look at you. You are the person who's offering the intervention or the help. Or, um, for example, out here you guys have something called 211. And if you have a problem in society, be it you don't have transportation, you don't have enough food, you don't have enough clothes, if you call 211, these people will help you get in touch with it. Um, it, it's a very, very simple solution, but it is available, and you, we, start telling other people that there's another way, you know, besides running over each other. I think that's a very a beautiful comment that you have there. It, it is, again, what I talked about before, role modeling. Okay? You smile to the world, and the world smiles back to you. Uh, and uh, uh, this resist business as usual, one individual at a time, it is going to create a ripple effect all over the world. We don't need to uh, uh, coerce anybody. Uh, we just need to uh, be uh, good role models. And eventually, uh, a lot of people will come along. But uh, my students in class, if I may expand a little bit on that, um, used to say, uh, what is the critical mass here? How many people in society is going to, uh, 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 you know, change uh, society? And according to sociologists, it is 13%. So let's say that 13% of the uh, people in the United States, uh, they have been thinking, even without talking to me or whatever, they have been thinking about this holistic well-being for a long time. Okay? Now we get together and uh, uh, we talk about it in these groups, in these support groups, and uh, we begin to talk to other people about it. Then there's going to be another 13% of the population that will say right away, I am right on. I believe in this 100%. Okay? Now we have 26% of the population that, uh, that are right on. Then there's going to be another 26 of the population that says, hmm, I can go both ways, you know. I see what you're saying, but you know, over there, uh, you know, that's what we have always done. This is cool too, even though maybe it's not so cool anymore and so forth. But they, they, you know, they would say, okay, we don't really like uh, the status quo society, so we'll, we'll go with you guys for a while and see what you can do. Now we have 52% uh, of the population that is on our side, right? And uh, so it's a majority, okay? So 13% is what it takes in order to change. And it's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen. And we need to keep this dream in mind. 
If we can't dream it, we can't do it. We have to have this dream and we have to work at it very, very hard. It's worth it. Over here. Um, it seems to me, I strongly, uh, I strongly believe that people do not see the ideology of a culture until they're outside of it. Yeah. So we are building an alternate ideology. And you are allowing people a different point of view and so they can see the ideology of the culture. I remember when I was growing up, the male patriarchy was it. I mean, I never questioned that until suddenly other women were questioning it and suddenly I was. So what you need to do, like you're saying, is expose people to an alternate ideology so they can see um, their ideology for themselves and see these, these flaws in it, if you will. Yeah, perfect, very good, yeah. Thank you, any other comments or questions? Oh, you didn't see your hand. I just uh, going back to your previous comment in terms of, you know, hopefully we can make a change. I think we're getting to the point where we need to see that we need to make a change. I don't think we have that much time left in terms of critical mass and the exponentially happening changes right now. But I do believe, like you said, it really starts with you. And if you question what you're doing, and you have these honest conversations with your family and your friends, it does start to resonate with people, and, and that's all it takes. But thank you, I really enjoyed your lecture today. So. Yeah. Thank you. So as you all know, we have a tradition here at HSGC to mug our speakers. So here's your official mugging. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, that's on your call train. Thank you very much. And she's going to come to lunch, and she's going to be here for comments and questions if you want to come up front. Hold on a sec. Hello, everybody. And as we wrap up here, you know, we have a lot of discussions about various things, but we don't always agree, but we always agree to not kill each other after the meeting. We're, that's what it is to be a humanist, right? I like Richard's lessons. Anyway, so as a community, we come together and we understand our differences, but we come together as one community, even though we disagree. So that's the key takeaway here today. Anyway, uh, we are having Flying Spaghetti Monster planning session right after this if you want to stick around for a few minutes and otherwise head to lunch. If you could help clean up, throw away some garbage, take the tablecloths, put them in the back with silverware, that would help out a lot. 